thanks for those who were able to get here. Thanks for those who are watching right now, listening. Others, so many others that will be watching or listening down the road. We pray that the word tonight in this Wednesday night class will be something that will encourage all of your people. Help us all to see something we've never seen before so that we could experience something we've never experienced. Thanks for the broadcast Friday at noon. Thank you, Lord, for the ability we have to keep that broadcast on the air. We ask a blessing on the, initial, the additional releases through the week as uh, Jeff is led to include them. Thanks for all the people that are praying, attending, supporting, and serving the Lord through this uh, local church and international ministry. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of bringing good news to people that desperately need it. The meeting's all yours, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Help us to see Jesus as we never have, even from an Old Testament point of view. Help us, Lord, to read ourselves in to the information you're giving us tonight. Through your servant, David, we pray it becomes crystal clear in our hearts and minds. Thank you for the new that is in the old, concealed, and the old that is in the new, revealed. Bless us tonight, Lord. Make us a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. <clears throat> we are in the book of Psalms tonight. If you were here Sunday or got a bulletin, you know we're thinking about trust. But be careful whom. Psalm 62, we're going to look primarily at the second half of this psalm, verses 8 through 12. There's a lot of information in here that's very, very helpful, especially regarding inner personal relationships, uh, and not just the relationship, but the timing that we're involved in the relationship. Tough times when we often reach out to someone else or sometimes uh, look within to find our own way out of the conflict. Uh, what are we thinking about tonight? What comes to my mind, um, give us kind of a background or basis, is a pretty famous quote. And it reads like this, it's Latin, fide sed qui vide, and it translates to trust, but be careful whom. You can put in parentheses, you trust. About 20 years ago, almost now, I studied uh, hypnosis, became certified in that, and also fear elimination therapy, and the school that I attended long distance was, uh, was based in the UK, and I think the, the school stayed open about 30, 40 years, I got in toward the close of it there. But that was the school motto. Fide sed qui vide, trust, but be careful whom. Trust, very important. That's what we're going to look at tonight. I want to think with you, first of all, with me tonight, uh, the power of personal testimony, uh, what we can do when we let our light shine, and then the divine alternative to reaching out to others when something goes south in our lives or trying to depend on ourselves to meet the issue. The alternative to those two things, which are our usual first go-to. Now, as we think about this, this Psalm 62, again, we're, we're looking primarily at verses 8 through 12. What happens here, in my view, is the sweet psalmist of Israel, David, left behind a kind of um, mountain, <clears throat> really a mountain of information and inspiration that will uh, help every true believer of the Lord because he was vocal, if you think about this, vocal through the, uh, the pen, if you will, because he was vocal and, and thought enough to write it down, you and I can be vindicated in life's fight. And here's another touching thought to me, and I hope you think about this regarding your own life. He's still bearing fruit from what he wrote 3,000 years later. The, 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 the living word never grows old, never dies, never goes out of style. So this is really quite something. 3,000 plus years later, you and I are still benefiting from David putting on paper what the Lord had shown him in his life and then also at the very end, a, a divine revelation. Personal testimony like this can be very powerful. Um, I remember in a lot of overseas meetings, they would grow night by night. You'd start out with, with a certain number of people. By the end of the week, you might have four or five hundred. And it was all because people that had been touched by God in some way during the next few days were telling other people about it. I've talked about the young lady that was healed of blindness 
uh, in my ministry to Crete one year, and she had testified to me after the fact that she told the Lord if she were healed of the blindness, she'd tell everybody and her, her brother there in Crete. And sure enough, one year later, she brought 40 people by boat from Crete to Athens where we were having our meetings. So it was because of one little testimony. Now, if you look at the whole psalm, uh, in verses 1 through 6, David is basically repeatedly, as well as publicly, vocally, praising God. And as, again, if you look at it, he, he praises God as his salvation, as his deliverance. He calls Yahweh his rock. He calls the Lord his stronghold, his hope, and one who, quote, keeps him from stumbling. I, I mentioned uh, probably in a message or two after it happened about three years ago now, um, I slipped going down the stairs in the middle of the night and I tumbled down over four, 14 stairs, and, but I didn't just make a straight line, you know, head over heels. I bumped the wall, bumped the, the uh, little banister there back and forth, back and forth, and I got to the bottom and I was convinced I had a lot of broken bones and this and that. And nothing had really happened. I mean, I got hurt, and I had a lot of swelling different places, but I didn't break anything, and, and, and everything was okay. Well, what happened? I think God kept me from stumbling, at least fatally. And then he concludes, Psalm 62, verse 7, he concludes with this. It's not called it a triumphant note. Upon God, the word there is Elohim, one of the many titles of Yahweh, Upon God, my salvation and my honor, my rock of strength, my refuge is in God. Another version has it, my mighty rock and protection. So this was David's go-to when things went south in his life. He didn't look to other people. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's something better. He also didn't look to himself to pull himself up and out by his own bootstraps. He looked to Elohim, and I want to just throw this in free of charge. Uh, Elohim, one of the many titles of God, and it's plural. It means basically the, the first one. But uh, there are two kinds of plurals, as I understand it, in the language of the Old Testament. Um, one is a literal plural noun, you know, more than one. The other is something called a plural of majesty, which means it's, it's written in the plural, but not because we're talking about more than one thing, but something that's great. And uh, why is this important, Pastor? Well, one reason is it's a whole section of the body of Christ that looks at Hebrew, um, Hebrews, sorry, at uh, Isaiah 53 about the suffering ser servant. And among other things, it says he dwelt with a rich man in his death. And they bring out the point that the death there is plural. Well, the sad part is that these people are mostly uneducated, ignorant, dictionary definition of the text, they're ignorant. And so they look at the plural and they say, see that? Jesus died tw twice. He died physically and spiritually. And that's where we get this horrible heresy of, of Jesus descending into hell uh, and being tormented three days and three nights in your place and mine. Uh, well, guess what, folks? Our, our, our judgment from God for sin is not three days and three nights in hell. It's an eternal separation from God, not three days and three nights. And guess what? G when Jesus died, he went into the presence of God. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, not into Satan. So I, I suggest we listen to uh, the Lord and the Lord's word rather than an, an uneducated or ignorant preacher. Um, so what kind of plural is that? It's a plural of majesty, a rich man in his deaths. His death is so important that the plural of majesty is used of the Lord. And I'd like to add something else here, a little bit of a different angle. As usual, the 70, the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, is very helpful, very beautiful here, and I, I mention it periodically. I mention it again. We look at this for a number of reasons. One of the main ones is this is the one that Jesus and the disciples and the Jews of his day were reading. This was their Bible. It was the people's Bible, the Septuagint. And this is what, it, what this reads. Upon totheo, upon the one true God, my salvation and my glory. O Theos, again, the one true God, the helper of me, look at this, and my hope is upon, to Theo, 
So, the, the one true God. Notice a few differences. The 70 uses the word hope, elpis, rather than refuge. It also uses the word helper, voithos, helper versus protection. So this gives us a little more information about what God was to David, what God can be to you, to me, and to every real believer. Hope, el piece in the Greek language, describes a confident expectation versus what you and I might call empty promises. I, I've kind of joked, but it's not really funny. I, 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 want, I had a plan to, to retire at 50, and I thought, you know, you start at 20, and you, you, you preach 30 years, that's about average, and I thought, that's a, you know, sounds good. Well, 50 came, and I didn't retire. So I thought, well, that's all right. A lot of people retired eight, at 55. We'll, we'll give it another five years. That didn't happen either, and then by the time I hit 60, I quit that. Ten years later, I'm still not retired, <laughs> but that is the kind of promise we might make to ourselves, I'll retire when I'm 50, that turns out to be an empty promise, you know, that this is not what hope means in the language of the New Testament <clears throat> and the Greek Old Testament. It means a confident expectation. Also, this word helper, helper, voithos, it's from um, a word that means you, you run to the cry of somebody in trouble. And it was originally used as a military term. When one group of soldiers needed help, they would call out. And the voice those would be someone, or perhaps several, would run to their aid and take up the slack and make up the difference. And this is beautiful because Paul uses this word regarding Jesus in Hebrews 2.18. He says there, because Jesus himself has been tempted, tested, and tried in all points as we are, he's able to be our voithos. He's able to run to our cry to assist us and relieve us when you and I are down and out or between the rock and the proverbial hard place. So you see here, I think, the wisdom of God in allowing the beautiful Old Testament to, to exist, not just in Hebrew with a small portion of Aramaic, but also into the other uh, language that became language of the, of the world, if you will, the Greek language. It's the same kind of Greek, by the way, that was uh, spoken in the New Testament, Kini Greek. So listen to David now. He moves from testimony, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's a great thing, as we've mentioned, to, to, to make public what God's done for you so other people hopefully can hear it, say, well, wow, if he did it for him, if he did it for her, if he did it for them, why can't he do it for us? And of course he will. Here's the, here's the advice now. From testimony to directing the faith of God's people. Trust in him, in him, Elohim, Yahweh. Trust in him at all times, O people. Almost anticipating, okay, David, and how do we do that? Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before God. God is a refuge to us. Another version has it, always rely on him. I like this one. Another version has it, have faith in him at all times. Now, once again, I thought this was really beautiful. I looked at this in the 70, and this is how verse 8 reads in the 70. Hope upon him at all times. And then this beautiful phrase, synagogi lao. Does that, that word synagogi sound familiar? Yeah, it's the Jewish synagogue appearing here in the Greek Old Testament. And Lao, of course, is peoples. So hope, hope upon him at all times, gathering of the people. Same thing. Pour out your hearts before him, and then, for God is our voithos. He's the one, when we're in trouble, that we call out to, and he runs to our aid, just like other soldiers would hear the call, of their fellow combatants and run to their aid. It's a beautiful picture. And again, we have the word hope there uh, in the place of, of um, the um, pr protection, that kind of thing, a refuge. He's, he's our hope. And uh, well, you might wonder, well, you know what? I never thought about that. Why in the world 
would Jewish people call their meeting place a synagogue? Well, for the same reason that they call their ruling party Sinedrion, which is another Greek word. Now, what language would you expect people that met in the synagogue to be speaking in there? Yeah, that, that, I'll just leave it there. It's food for thought. Some of our friends that kind of wonder, did any of the Jewish people maybe speak a little Greek? Um, yes. So let's now look to the divine alternative to looking to others to bail us out, help us, deliver us, or looking within to ourselves to do the same thing. David's last revelation, in my opinion, alone worth the time that he took to write this. Um, I don't know about you, but I think most believers, if they really think about it or are, are candid, honest about it, from time to time they probably wonder and long, wonder after and look for a clear, concise, complete definition of exactly how you and I and all believers can trust in the Lord. What, what does that mean? Read the scripture. What does that mean? Throw our hands up. Uh, you know, what does it mean to spend a lot of time on our knees? Aren't you glad that David told us, pour out our hearts before him? In other words, come clean. Drop the pretense that we've got it together when we don't. I often tell people I finally got it all together and then dropped it. We don't have it together. We don't know what we're doing. And yet we don't want to admit that because we're hardwired to look after ourselves. And we don't do that very well. So if we find ourselves filling ourselves, then what do we do? Generally reach out to someone else to fix us, right? Of course, we don't realize that while we're dialing their number or punching a text into them, they're already uh, beating us to the punch and they're asking us for help. So why would we do this? Why would we choose to take off the mask to stop playing games and pretending we're okay or we can handle it or with our friends' help, help we can handle it? Why, why do we take so much dif uh, difficult time suffering rather than going to the Lord? what's wrong with looking to other human beings who are going through the same struggles? Here again is David to the rescue, verse 9. Men of low birth are nothing, and men of high position are not what they seem. Mortal men are only a breath, another version says. Even important men, a delusion. I like this one. Altogether less than a breath. That's why, David says, don't depend on other people, whether they're people that are well-known and rich and have it all together, or someone just like you, maybe, who still you think is a little quicker on the draw than you are. This is why. It's, it's a waste of time. And listen to the 70 on verse 9. Why shouldn't we look to others? Why shouldn't we look to our own selves? The sons of men are vain, the sons of men are psevis. Wow, we get the word pseudo from that. In other words, they have a facade, just like an actor. They have a, a certain costume, they have certain makeup, and they have certain lines that they use. But it's false. It, it's kind of like the old, the old song, you know, you're advertising steak, but all you can produce is bologna. You see how, how wise, in my opinion, how wise it is of the Lord to give us the, the beautiful Old Testament, not just in one language, but in two. The sons of men are psevis. They're pseudo. They're, they're a, a crude imitation of the real deal. So why, in other words, why waste time trusting people who are in as bad a situation as we are, or perhaps worse? The obvious answer is we shouldn't do it. <clears throat> Let's continue. Here's some more good advice, again from the 70. Stop. El pisite, which means stop hoping. Stop hoping upon unrighteousness. How many of you know people have done really immoral or unethical or sinful things to get out of trouble? We've all heard about it. People are in jail because they came up, they cooked up a scheme to get themselves out of whatever mess they were in. And th it would be better if the translators of the old covenant Hebrew into Greek would have 
written this a different way, but they didn't. They didn't say, don't do this. You know, they, it's not like a warning. You're doing pretty good, so don't fall. Don't do this. No. Stop your current practice. El Pizete. Stop depending or trusting or hoping upon unrighteousness and upon robberies. Stop lusting. In other words, they look at that bank. They, they look at that country store. <laughs> they start salivating like Labrador dogs. You know, if we knock that joint over, we can clean out the safe, be on our merry way, and finally get out of debt. Stop uh, lusting after robberies. If riches do pour in, stop setting your heart upon it. Why? Why? Because it's temporary and it's unsatisfying. You may remember King Solomon said several places, Proverbs 23, verse 5, Ecclesiastes verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 10. Riches, gold, silver, they all have a way of spreading wings and flying off into the sunset, leaving us behind the eight ball, as it were. In other words, anything natural, anything on this sin-cursed earth has a sell-by date. So you, you literally can't depend on it. You can't count on anything. And uh, my, my personal view is this is where most of humanity is today. And, and again, this is my personal opinion. I, I make, try to make a difference between when I'm teaching or preaching something from the Word and then my own opinion. This is my opinion. I feel like people have drastically changed since the plague in late, two, in late 2019 and 2020. I think uh, they've begun trying to reach out for anything that would be of substance when they're in trouble. But it's like trying to hold on to sand. Exactly what David has told us in this Psalm 62. It doesn't work. Anything natural has a sell-by date. Now, as we come in for a landing here, David moves from association or what he has learned about walking with God and seeing God as his rock, as his refuge, as his standby, uh, as his voithos, the person that he just calls out to and he runs to his aid to relieve him. How he arrived at all this, he goes from that to something else, a revelation. Now, I don't want this to undercut what we've already been looking at, that the power of David's testimony of his own life and you read his life story and see how God delivered him over and over and over again. We're not making light of that. It's very important, and testimony is, is tremendous. It gives glory to God. Uh, it, it firms things in our own experience that we've gone through, and it also is a blessing to someone else. But there's something even better, and that's what he's doing here, divine revelation. There's nothing like divine revelation. <clears throat> Listen to what David not only experience, but now this is an experience that he had of listening and hearing the heart of God. Elohim, the first, he spoke. And the idea is he only had to say it once. Twice I heard. Both of these are perfect tense. In other words, once the voice came and then the voice came again, it didn't have to be repeated. It just stayed with David. It reverberated. He spoke once. Twice I heard this, that strength belongs to Elohim. So what did David respond to when he heard that? To you, O Lord, Adonai. To you, O Lord, steadfast love, because you will be requiting to a man according to his works. And guess what? God does not grade on a curve. No redos like back in high school, you know. Well, I blew that test. Can I retake it? No. So, yeah, sometimes you could. And not this one. <clears throat> no curveball. This is how it reads in the 70. Otheos, the one true God, spoke once. Then David... Uh, in, in the minds of the translators, uses a real strong demonstrative pronoun, tafti. These two things I heard, that the strength to, to theu, to the one true God, and the mercy is yours, O Kyrie, O Lord, 
for you, lest we forget, he adds the personal pronoun again, for you, you will recompense everyone according to their works, according to who they trusted, how they lived their lives. Was it dependent upon other people? Was it dependent upon themselves? Was it dependent upon their crooked schemes? Or was it dependent upon God? Now, as we close this tonight, I found this very, very interesting. As soon as I read that, what David had heard and about the end of life, I it just came right into my mind. This was verified by God in the flesh. The Lord Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. If you read the surrounding verses there, Jesus is telling the believing and unbelieving Jewish folk around him and any pagans that would have been there that God, because of who Jesus is, God the Son as well as the Son of God, the Father has given all judgment to the Lord Jesus. And in John 5, 28 and 29, he basically echoes something written ten, uh, a thousand years before. How crazy is this when you and I just kind of step back? David's writing for you, for me, for all of us 3,000 years ago. Fast forward 2,000 years and Jesus confirms what David wrote. Here's what he said in John 5, 28 and 29. Now, this is not a disciple. That would have been good enough. Uh, this is God in the flesh speaking. After telling people that God the Father had put all judgment in his hands. Stop marveling, Jesus says, at this. For an hour is coming in which, in which each and every one in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. The ones having continually practiced the good things toward a resurrection characterized by life. But the ones having continually practiced the evil things toward a resurrection characterized by judgment. John 5, 28, 29. Oh, wow. So as long as I can do good things, I've got it made. So salvation is by works. Awesome. Uh, no. We're going to look at that in a couple of weeks. But let me tell you what the good things are that the believers who receive life have done versus the bad things that the unbelievers have done that cause them not to receive eternal life. 1 John 3.23, not the Gospel of John now, but the first letter of John the Apostle, chapter 3, verse 23. I love this verse. I use it a lot in my books because it's so succinct. The good things, quote unquote, that God is going to requite us for, according to David, are not the Old Testament law or some kind of precept. No, they are this. John says, and this, same word that Jesus used, strong demonstrative pronoun. And this, afti, is his commandment. We ought to be on the edge of our seat. What is it? Tithing on the gross rather than the net? Going to church three days a week instead of two? Uh, making sure we, we worship on the Sabbath, not just Friday night, but Saturday morning also. W what are these things, e eating kosher, you know, some of this nonsense that's going around today and selling lots of books? No. And this is his commandment, the Jewish apostle John said, in order that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and should be loving one another, even as he gave commandment to us. He goes on to talk about unbelievers not keeping those commandments and furthering hatred and so on. Those are the evil things that they practice. We're practicing the good things, believing on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and his commandment to love one another, or as he said in another place, to love each other as he loves us. So there you have the full picture and you have Jesus Christ confirming a thousand years after the fact something David wrote 3,000 years ago for us. And it's all the same picture. What a beautiful thing. And what a release. What a relief 
to walk out from under trying to paddle our own canoe or depending on other people who are more than likely in worse shape than we are and instead turn toward the Lord, take the mask off, stop pretending we've got it all together and just pour out the contents of our heart before him. The other day, because of a number of different situations, it seemed like everything had crowded up on me. And I thought, you know what? I am just going to stop, look, and listen. And I sat in my chair in my study. I quit working on what I was working on. I think it was Sunday sermon. I just put my feet up, closed my eyes, and I just began to quietly empty the, car, the, the, the contents of my heart. That's what prayer is. And we'll touch on that a little bit in coming Sundays. But uh, one of the main words for prayer in the New Testament is prosephi. Ephi is a, a wish, a desire, and process toward. So that's what prayer is. It's a wish or a desire we have, and we aim it toward God. And so there I was in my chair, in my study, had my eyes closed, just me and the Lord, and I'm praying undertone in the prayer language, but in my head, I'm talking to the Lord. Lord, I wish this. I wish that. I wish I went down this laundry list. Why did I do that? I had just been studying this. David says, don't trust them. Don't trust yourself. Trust God at all times. How do I do that, David? Pour out the contents of your heart upon him. You know what happened? About an hour later, I was poured out. And I just sat there, and it seemed like something had been removed from down here. And it wasn't weight, unfortunately. But it was just gone. And I thought, why was I needlessly carrying that stuff around when all I had to do was admit I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea how to change things, but I need something changed. And I just let him take care of it. Is he going to do it? Of course he's going to do it. Before I call, he answered. Well, I'm still speaking. He hears. And I'm going to be living out the results of that prayer time day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Who knows how far ahead I have prayed and how far ahead he has already answered. So I wanted to share that as a final testimony. That's why I was moved to do this and to go all the way back to the beginning of today's tonight's Wednesday night class. Thank God David chose to share his information with us, his personal association with God, and then finally the revelation of, of a word from God that was basically twofold as the 70 translates it. Otheo spoke once, two things, these two things I heard when he spoke. Strength belongs to him and mercy is his, for you will recompense everyone according to their works. Isn't that good news? Anybody have any questions about this or input, output? We'll come around the Lord's table. Praise the Lord. Those of you watching, I, I, again, forgive me, I forget, but if our, if our messages and our ministry and our services are blessing you, and uh, you have a heart for the full gospel, a heart for missions, a heart for uh, Christianity without a lot of things added on. Uh, you're welcome to partner with us in gifts and prayers and whatever you think you can do to help the ministry.